The topic I've chosen to focus on today is what I'm calling the 21st century skills gap, because I believe this is one of the greatest challenges of our time. It's affecting increasingly every part of society, and we see it in the headlines all around us every day, in unemployment figures, in the wage gap, the gap between rich and poor, rising, rising poverty levels. Now, the theme of this conference is catalyzing change, and it's fitting that we're gathered here today in one of the world's great public universities, because if there's any institution that's in need of transformational change, it's public higher education. Public higher education faces a perf perfect storm of rising costs, student demand that outstrips enrollment capacity, funding slashed by the states, classes overflowing, and even if you manage to get through and get a degree, it's no longer a guarantee of employment. And this is something I feel very passionately about. I'm a product of public higher education, got my degree here at UC Berkeley in biophysics, and my heart breaks when I see these headlines. Hundreds of thousands turned away from community colleges. California now spends more on our correction systems, on prisons, than higher education. And on this trajectory, we'll be one million graduates short of economic demand by 2025. Students are shouldering an increasing larger, increasingly larger share of the cost of education, nearly 50% in California. And in turn, student debt is reaching now record numbers. Two-thirds of graduates uh, go out in the world in debt, averaging $25,000 debt per person. And total student debt now exceeds credit card debt nationwide, a trillion dollars. Yet, despite all the cost, despite all the money spent on education, we've got a generation of un- and underemployed young people, 75 million globally, 12 million here in the U.S., and more than half of graduates in the U.S. are either un- or underemployed, and they're three times more likely to be unemployed compared to their parents. Yet, despite that, employers say they can't find skilled workers. 44% say they can't even find skilled workers for entry-level jobs. Millions of high-tech jobs are going unfilled. If you just go down to Silicon Valley, you'll find that out immediately, and more than three million jobs are open and unfilled here in the U.S. So there's a big disconnect, and in fact, when you survey students, employers, and education providers, you find very different views on whether they believe that college grads are actually prepared for employment. 45% of students think they're prepared, not a very high number. Even fewer employers, 42%, think those students are prepared to go out in the world. And yet 72% of education providers think they're doing just fine preparing students for 21st century jobs. So we got a big challenge here, clearly. Our challenge is to preserve the excellence of our public higher education system while simultaneously increasing access dramatically so that many more can attend, cutting unnecessary cost, and transforming curriculum for the 21st century. Given the enormity of this challenge, the key to survival is to innovate. And specifically, we need the willingness to embrace new ideas, radical new ideas, and new ways of thinking. Now, it's worth noting that the public higher education system here in the U.S. was actually born out of a crisis and, in fact, was based on some pretty radical thinking. Uh, President Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, signed this into law. It was called the Murrill Land Act over 150 years ago, and it established this network of public universities. This was based on Thomas Jefferson's vision 100 years earlier, and he envisioned a system that would be open to all, that would foster an educated, informed citizenry, a meritocracy where ideas and intellect would trump privilege and status. So have we delivered on Jefferson's vision? Well, in some ways, yes, we have. But today we face a new crisis, and it's that skills gap. It's affecting everybody. And we need a new approach to the teaching model. We need a new way of thinking about how we deliver public education. What's needed is a revolution in public higher education that embraces open content, that enables personalized, interactive, collaborative learning, much more engaged, and breaks down institutional barriers that have existed too long between, for example, our K-12 system, higher ed, industry, and so forth. Well, it turns out there is a revolution underway. It's called the MOOC revolution, Massive Online Open Courses. Now, this is kind of a funny name, and it's not exactly a new idea. Online courseware has been available for a long time, but now we finally have the technology to deliver it at scale with very high production values and devices that can access that content anywhere in the world. And we're seeing huge numbers of student enroll students enrolling. There's some skepticism about this, as with anything new, but the early results actually show promise. In fact, the pass rate for one circuit design class that was offered at Harvard 
increased from 59% before to 91% after. So clearly, there's something going on here. What's interesting is we're seeing different patterns emerge in the way that students consume this online content. In fact, uh, Phil Hill has actually broken it down into four categories, the lurkers, the drop-ins, the, the passive participants, and the active participants. And the active participants is where the action is. That's where we're seeing transformational change when it comes to student outcomes. In fact, there's a new acronym, SPOCS, Small, Pri Small Private Online Classes, that was actually coined right here at Berkeley. Students watch the videos outside of class, do interactive quizzes, and then come into class Students then engage with instructors and each other, and they learn from each other, from the questions other students ask. So that's exciting, and that's a very promising development in education. But it's not really so much about cost-cutting, it's about transforming teaching and learning. There are other opportunities, though, to cut costs. For example, only 50% of undergrads receive a degree in six years. We've got a throughput problem there. And not only that, but 34% of freshman undergrads take remedial courses, 34%. That adds up to a loss of $3.7 billion every year nationwide. And on top of that, students often have to repeat courses they've already taken, even if they ace those courses, when they're within a system and they transfer, say, from a community college to a state college. That adds up to a loss of $30 billion a year. So clearly, there's an opportunity here for some significant cost-cutting. So what if we, for example, redesigned and consolidated the top 25 to 40 lower division undergraduate classes, and we offered them online, open, and we made those credits seamlessly transferable between any educational institution? That would actually save $9.7 billion nationwide if we did that annually. That's serious money, and this is an opportunity to address both a cost issue and also take technology and leverage it for something that transforms education. Now, I want to focus on STEM for just a minute, science, technology, engineering, and math, because that's, as we know, where the real job growth is, the significant, most significant job growth over the next several decades. But we're finding that young adults don't tend to pursue STEM, and they cite reasons like they don't really know, understand much about the fields, they think it's just a bunch of nerds, they think it's too challenging, and they, feel not, they don't feel well prepared. So what do we do? Well, we've got to do something because we're graduating a pretty small number of STEM students every year in comparison to other countries. We lag. Less than 16% of degrees are in STEM. And actually, only 56% of students who major in engineering actually graduate with an engineering degree. Again, we've got a throughput problem. Yet, five out of eight new jobs, eight out of 10 of the highest paying jobs will be in STEM-related careers. Now, if we just focus on that throughput problem, just that one problem alone, and increase the percent of students who actually graduate in engineering or STEM, we would actually produce 750,000 more graduates by the end of the decade. So how do we do that? Well, again, we can look at ways of, and in fact, this is happening, transform STEM education, transform the way we teach these subjects, make it much more collaborative, interactive, and apply to real-world settings. And that's critical, because this is where the jobs are. 120,000 new jobs, again, back to the skills gap. This is where the great growth in jobs are over the next decade. And yet, only 2.4% of all degrees are in computer science. So com computer science is a very interesting major, because you compare it to all the other majors. In fact, in this graph, I'm comparing it to, say, social sciences. Tremendous job growth, annually over 150,000 jobs, yet we only graduate 60,000 or so computer science majors. Social science, we graduate a quarter of a million uh, students every year, and yet only 50,000 jobs are available in that field. Now, this doesn't mean everyone needs to go be a computer scientist, but it, what it does mean is that we have to find a way to make these, these courses, this curriculum, much more engaging. And we're leaving a big chunk of the population behind. In fact, the percent of women who are actually majoring in computer science, graduating with computer science degrees, has declined significantly in the last 25 years, from 34% at a high in 84 to now just over 12%. How can this be when high tech is one of the most exciting careers out there? Well, they get turned off. And it's, it's a shame because, in fact, some of the world's first programmers were women. In Bletchley Park in the UK, they were Enigma code crackers. They decoded the Nazi Enigma machine. Women were very instrumental in that. And in fact, the first computers were actually women. This is the ENIAC 
machine back in uh, World War II again. The Army actually hired women out of the University of Pennsylvania to calculate ballistics trajectories. And these women were math majors that did very, who did very complex differential equations by hand and then plugged the results into these machines. They were called refrigerator ladies, actually, because they were mistaken for models in the photos that were taken of the ENIAC machines at the time. The point is that women, of course, can code. Women can make great computer scientists. And we need diversity because we need more engineers. We need more underrepresented minorities in this field as well. And we need products that are designed by a diverse set of developers. So there's lots of reasons why we need to attack this problem. So how do we do that? Well, let's start with K-12. Only one in 10 K-12 school teaches computer science. And even that one school, it doesn't even count towards graduation, that, that class. So we need more K-12 computer science. How do we do that? Industry is stepping in. Well, that's great. Google, Microsoft, and many others are throwing millions of dollars at this, putting teachers into the schools part-time. And then there's great organizations like Code.org, uh, Girls Who Code, and, and so forth that are doing very important work. And we need more of that. But we need to scale faster. So how do we put more computer science teachers in K-12 when we don't have enough of them? Well, it turns out kids are pretty good at learning on their own when you give them the right tools. And in fact, the winner of the TED Prize this year is Sugata Mitra. He's proven this with a set of experiments that he calls the Hole in the Wall Project. He put a computer in actually in a wall, installed it in a wall that was between a high-tech company and a high-tech institution and a slum. And he just left it there to see what kids would do. And it turned out these kids, who didn't really have any education, became very adept at using these computers within days. They were running applications. And he repeated this experiment at several other villages in India. And inspired by this experiment, MIT Media Lab, the MIT Media Lab team, took a bunch of tablets and just last year dropped them off in a village in Ethiopia. They were taped and boxed up. They didn't provide any instruction. The tablets actually had video cameras running so that they could monitor what the kids did. Within four minutes, the first kid had turned on the computer. Within days, each kid was learning and using, on, app, on average, about 47 applications. Within two weeks, they were reciting the ABCs. They didn't know English before this. And within five months, they had actually hacked Android to turn on a feature, a camera feature that had been turned off in, this, in these tablets. So we know this works. We know that kids can learn on their own, especially when we make the apps engaging and fun. There's a new app that was just launched this week called Hopscotch. It's a game. It teaches kids how to code. They don't even know they're learning how to code. They just know they're playing a fun game. So we're taking this idea, a group of us in Silicon Valley, and actually, based on a $60 tablet, at cost $60, uh, we're, we're going to get this tablet in as many hands, and as many kids' hands as possible in the US. This is a, a real uh, significant uh, computing device. It's a gigahertz processor at the speed of an iPad 1. It has built-in high-def video. It's a smartphone as well. It's preloaded with apps that make it fun and easy to learn how to code. And we want to see if kids can teach themselves to code. So we're going to launch pilots. We're going to run contests, app development contests, with cash prizes. And we're going to see what happens. But this is the key to the future of learning. It's hands-on. It's self-discovery. I know this from my own experience. I grew up here in Berkeley. And when I was a kid, my mom would drop me off at a place called the Lawrence Hall of Science in the afternoons, and I would play on the mainframes up there that were running this thing called ELIZA. ELIZA was one of the first AI programs. It was an online psychiatrist. And you would actually have a conversation. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling crummy. Why are you feeling crummy? I don't know. Why don't you know? It was really quite annoying, like a typical psychiatrist. However, it was fascinating, and it really sparked my interest about software and computers. And that's what caused me to, to actually ultimately go down the road um, of, of, of computers and programming and ultimately the career that I pursued. And it's not just about learning how to code, because computational thinking is actually a critical 21st century skill. It teaches you logical thinking, abstract thinking, problem solving, and everybody needs it. Not just computer scientists. Sociologists are data scientists today. Biologists need to decode human genes. Artists, architects, accountants, everybody needs to know how to think computationally. This is not just for computer scientists. So what do we do? We get it into K-12, we get computer science, we teach coding to kids, we allow them to learn on their own, and we get undergrad classes for everybody. Undergrad classes like the beauty and joy of computing that was developed here at Berkeley, um, and it's now being offered also at Harvard. We're seeing record enrollment across all majors. Everyone can learn this stuff. Everyone needs to learn. 
how to think computationally, how to think outside the box, how to think at a system abstract level. The maker movement in education is also very exciting. This is, this is actually teaching kids technology by allowing them to tinker and build stuff. They learn when there's a, a, a goal at the end of the, of the road. They can create a, a robot and learn circuit design along the way. So this is a very important tool within education as well. So bottom line, make computer science a core class in high school, university, enable kids to learn on their own, and focus on solving real-world problems. That's how we attack the STEM learning problem. And that's already showing great results in, in early experiments. Another very important part of this is breaking down the barriers between institutions so that industry, educators, community co are collaborating. A program called Linked Learning that was launched in the Long Beach Public Schools and it integrates industry experience into real-world industry applications into curriculum in high school. So when you're learning chemistry, you're solving a crime. You're not just learning chemistry for the sake of learning chemistry. Uh, this has doubled the rate of minority enrollment in college in the early experiments. Now, I've talked a lot about STEM and computers, but what about the arts? To be a fluent citizen of the 21st century, the arts are actually really important. And Yo-Yo Ma gave a talk a couple weeks ago at the Kennedy Center when he said, he pointed out that imagination, collaboration, flexibility, innovation, these are critical skills that employers are looking for in, in the uh, applicants. And the arts teach these skills. The arts actually are critical in enabling you to think out the outside the box, have a flexible mind. And again, I speak from experience. I grew up studying dance, and it taught me how to think at a big picture, how to break down a big problem into small pieces, how to reverse something on the left and then the right, how to think at a system level, how to be comfortable on a stage in front of a lot of people. The arts are critically important. And in fact, as he puts it, what the most important stuff really happens at the edges and the intersections. That's, that's where the jobs in the 21st century will be. It's where computation meets biology. It's where design meets robotics. And that's why the arts are important, as well as STEM learning. So preparing for 21st century jobs, it's a big, it's a big challenge, right? Because we don't know what most of these jobs will be. The apps economy didn't even exist four years ago, but it generated $80 billion last year. So what do we learn if we don't even know what the jobs are going to be? Well, clearly, we need to know how to think. And that's, again, why fluency in key skills like computational thinking and the arts is important. And entrepreneurial thinking, the ability to put together different pieces, think outside the box, be resourceful, and be flexible. As Alvin Toffler said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, relearn, and unlearn. And he's right. So we've got a doozy of a crisis here with a skills gap, but as the adage goes, never let a good crisis go to waste. So by embracing technology as a mass, a weapon of mass instruction, combined with great teachers, collaborative learning, and real-world applications, and breaking down the barriers between institutions, and embracing innovative ideas, and figuring out what works, throwing out what doesn't, but scaling what does, that's how we're going to transform and actually prepare for the 21st century and a citizenry that's prepared and skilled for the kinds of jobs that are coming. Thank you very much.